started. Thank you, uh, everyone, for um, coming on board this morning for this uh, webinar on open textbooks and open educational resources. What are they? Where can I find them? And how do they support student success? So um, this is a fairly introductory level um, webinar. Uh, I've used a similar form for, of this presentation to talk to faculty and our academic staff um, and make presentations on campus to people who are interested about open educational resources. So um, again, it, it's an introductory form. Just to let you know, this is um, Creative Commons CC BY licensed. You'll see my license at the bottom. And you can find this presentation on the uh, library guide that uh, we had linked for this, and I'll give you the link for this at the end too. So please feel free to download it, reuse it, remix it, redistribute it, do whatever you like. So welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I'd like to first thank uh, MIALA, the Michigan Academic Library Association, for providing us this Zoom platform this morning. I really appreciate it. And also for opening up this webinar um, to across the state. I uh, thought it was a really wonderful partnership, and I really appreciate their support. So as we get started, oh, well, I'm sorry, I can't get my slides to move forward. So let me see if I can try that again. All right, this is going to be a little bit challenging because I don't seem to be able to get my slides to move forward on, for me. So I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to do this old school and kind of look pretty incompetent here. <laughs> but all right. So um, open educational resources, what are they? And what is the public domain? So open educational resources are teaching and learning materials that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution. So open is really important because that means that you have the right to retain and reuse the content, revise it, remix it, and redistribute it. Generally, open educational resources are not gonna require a login or other personal identification from students or faculty. And it includes everything from videos to simulation software, lesson outlines, uh, public book repositories, et cetera. So I think what's really important to think about here is what does public domain mean? And public domain is um, refers to creative materials that are not protected by intellectual property laws, such as copyright, trademark, trademark or patent laws. So the public owns public domain works and no individual author or artist owns them. Anybody can use a public domain work without obtaining permission, but no one, no one can ever own it. As of 2020, copyright has expired for all works published in the United States before 1924. In other words, if the work was published before January 1, 1924, you are free to use it in the US without permission. If a work was published before 1964, the owner had to file a renewal with the Copyright Office during the 28th year after publication. No renewal meant a loss of copyright. If a work is published prior to 1964 and it's not par marked public domain, however, you need to research the records of the Copyright Office to determine if a renewal was filed. So resources like Project Gutenberg uh, provide free access to public domain books in their original form published prior to 1924, such as Little Women. So those are the kinds of books that you can find um, on, in the public domain. But one of the things that makes an open educational resource uniquely open educational resource is that it has a Creative Commons license. So this is what makes open educational resources different than just stuff you find on the web. Somebody has taken the time to tell you how they would like their work reused. So first, let's talk about what copyright means. 
copyright exists without me doing anything to assert it from the moment of creation. So if I write something and, and fix it in a medium, then it is, it is, it exists and it's mine and I own the copyright to it. If you explicitly assign or surrender your copyright, um, then that changes that. But if you do not, copyright persists regardless of license. Copyright grants the creator very specific legal rights and remedies. Most forms of copyright have a defined duration. In the United States, for works created after January 1, 1978, copyright protection lasts for the life of the author plus an additional 70 years. For an anonymous work, a pseudo-anonymous work, or a work made for hire, the copyright endures for a term of 95 years from the year of its first publication, or a term of 120 years from the year of its creation, whichever expires first. A license is a legal document. The copyright holder has the, ex has the right to explicitly choose or create a license. It does not apply automatically like copyright does. Licenses grant the users of a work specific and limited rights. Unless stated in the license itself or until it is revoked, it remains enforceable in perpetuity. So in Creative Commons, we have our five R's, retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. These are Creative Commons licenses. They are used um, to identify how a copyright holder licenses a work for use. The five R's apply to the first two um, images that you see that have the green boxes around them. So CC BY is a Creative Commons license that grants users the ability to do anything that they like with it. They can, um, they can remix it, they can revise it, they can reuse it, they can redistribute it. There is no restrictions on that. B CC BY SA is a share alike license. So what that means is that if I give you the right to do anything with my work, any subsequent works need to be shared alike by the same exact license. So that's important um, to know. And that's something that uh, if, if you're a Creative Commons, if you're using a Creative Commons license, you might want to think about that. Do you want any works that other people produce from your work to also carry that same licensing. And then there's some others. So you'll see there's the CC by NC, and that means you can do whatever you like with this work, except you cannot, re you cannot have any commercial purposes. You cannot make any money from these works. So that's what NC means, non-commercial uses. CC by NC and SA means no commercial uses. Any subsequent works will be shared alike. CC BY ND means you could use this work, uh, but you cannot create derivative works. So in a sense, this isn't a fully open educational resource, but it can be reused in an educational setting as it is. So as it stands, you just can't make derivative works from it. And CC BY NC ND is the most restrictive of the Creative Commons licenses. It allows um, you to reuse retain and redistribute the work, but you cannot revise and remix it. In other words, you cannot make derivative works and you cannot make commercial works. And if anybody has questions as we're going along or comments, please feel free to post them in the chat box. So, What's important is what open educational resources also are not. And this can sometimes be a little confusing because things are being marketed in the commercial sector that look like they're open, but they're actually not. So uh, e-textbooks by commercial publishers, including rentals, are not open educational resources or OER. Custom textbooks that can only be purchased through a retailer are not OER. Semester course fees for platform access, sometimes known as first day initiatives or inclusive access programs, are not OER. 
Um, these are programs that provide students with access to a publisher developed materials for a set fee, and it's usually a fairly low set fee during uh, the entire semester. Sometimes that access persists after the semester, sometimes it does not, uh, but there are licenses that institutions have to enter into to offer these types of initiatives. And students, even though there are opt-out options, they're really not feasible because there are usually homework or other kinds of electronic programs that are um, connected to these first day or inclusive access programs. Additionally, OER platforms by commercial publishers that require a per semester fee for students' access are not OER. We call this open washing and open wrapping. Um, open washing is to spin a product or company as open, although it is not. It is derived from the word greenwashing um, from Michelle Thorne. Uh, and it can also have an appearance of open source and open license for marketing purposes while continuing proprietary practices. And that definition's from Audrey Waters. Open wrapping is charging for the services and support provided around the content. These quote unquote value added services may come in the form of learning platforms, content management systems, ancillary teaching materials, uh, adaptive or personalized learning tools, data analytics, and other things. A lot of publishers say they will curate a collection of OER for instructors and put it together using learning design principles. And I would argue that, guess what? I'm sure most of us um, attending today have talented professionals at our institutions who can support faculty in doing that. Um, they're called subject specialist librarians or liaison librarians, instructional designers. Um, we, we at, in our institutions, can divide, to define our curation strategy for you. But if publishers are just funneling everything into a selection portal, that is not curation. And if they are selecting, it's not necessarily respecting academic freedom. So um, publishers saying they're curating, I would question what that means exactly and how they're doing it, what their criteria is. So a big question many times about OER is what about the quality? Uh, faculty are very concerned about the quality of open educational resources, but I think it's important to remember that um, we want to focus on projects that focus on quality. So many of the funded projects that I'll talk about in a few minutes do that, just that. They do focus on quality. They've been reviewed by educators. They have post-production reviews by faculty. They use sustainable practices. So in other words, they're going to have a platform that's going to sustain access to that material so that um, you'll be able to uh, get to that material. They carry a Creative Commons license, and I think that's really important to realize, to look for in your resources, your open educational resources, is has someone taken the time to license that material? And if they have, they've thought about how they want you to reuse it. And I think um, that's really important because it indicates that there is a concern about sustainability of that resource and being responsible for its content. And just remember, um, for everybody, your librarian, of course, can help you locate quality open educational resources. So where can I find these open educational resources? So some places um, are, there are some really good places to find uh, open educational resources. One of those is the OER Commons. And if you're not familiar with the OER Commons, I'm just gonna quickly see if I can. There we go.
So I'm hoping that you can see the OER comments. You'll want to go to hover on the bottom and with the share button, go to um, share and it should be your internet browser. I think we're only looking at your PowerPoint. Okay, you're still looking at the PowerPoint. All right. Got it. Sorry, I'm a novice when it comes to using Zoom from this perspective. <laughs> okay, so this is the OER Commons. Um, it's a great place to find open educational resources. It requires uh, people who deposit materials here to have a Creative Commons license on their materials. So that's uh, really important. I think what's really nice about this and what I like about some of the other resources I'll show you also is that it has the ability to sort through materials so that you can drill down to what you really want. So for example, I could look for college resources in the life sciences. And if I do a search that way, it's going to go ahead and bring up materials for me. And they also have ratings here, which is very helpful. And I'm hoping that as the community grows for open educational resources, those uh, people will take the time to rate the resources. So you can see, for example, this um, acidic oceans resource has gotten four stars on it. And you just click on the item to actually get to it. Um, it tells you about the resource. It tells you about what the license is. Um, and it even gives you comments from users. So that's one of the first ways that we can look at those. I'm going to just bring up another one here. Um, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the Open Textbook Library for the University of Minnesota. Um, this is, again, a really good resource. They've ingested thousands of, well, I shouldn't say thousands. They have 699 textbooks that are open licensed textbooks quality textbooks. They also have a, um, a faculty review process that they do outside of this. So again, for example, you can get into um, a particular topic pretty easily, and then you can see the ratings of those uh, open textbooks, and you can also read the ratings. And this gives you the PDF, it gives you the online, it gives you the license. Uh, so it's a very easy way to browse for textbooks. Uh, what I just learned about recently was the OER MetaFinder. So this is kind of, um, this is from Mason and you can find resources from all of these different spaces uh, in the OER MetaFinder. So it's also a nice place to search. It includes archival collections if you're somebody who likes to use primary sources in a class or is looking for primary sources. And then finally, go back here. So again, what's really nice about these resources is that they, they are um, openly licensed resources generally, and you don't, they, there's a higher quality. In many cases, there's a review process. So you get two resources that meet the needs of faculty pretty quickly. So let's talk a little bit about open textbooks because um, open educational resources can be a variety of different kinds of things, but open textbooks are really just that. They're intended to be the textbook used for class um, and they follow in a more traditional format. They're openly licensed, they're free to print, free to read online, free to download, and in most cases, customizable if they are following the full 5R. So where do you find these open textbooks? Um, 
and so OpenStax from Rice University uh, is sort of the probably the gold standard in open textbook publishing. They had a fairly large grant and they have created a large series of open textbooks intended to specifically cover the um, first and second year gen ed courses that are that are offered at most institutions. So there is a, you'll find that there is a pretty good selection of open textbooks for those, that sort of standard gen ed curriculum. And uh, OpenStax is uh, well situated and they also have a very good um, community. So when you, when you are a faculty member and adopt an OpenStax textbook, you, if you let them know that you're adopting it, you'll have access to a lot of other teacher materials, instructor materials um, that are available to you when you sign up through OpenStax. So that sort of violates one of those principles that you shouldn't have to create an account. So uh, just to be clear, you don't have to create an account to get an OpenStax to use an OpenStax textbook in your course. But if you do create an account in the OpenStax.org site, you will have access to more resources. Additionally, what's really nice about OpenStax is students can opt to purchase a print textbook and some students do have that preference. They are fairly inexpensive. They run between 25 and I think the most expensive is $40 um, and they're hard bound. Here at Wayne State, what we did is we purchased the full run of the OpenStax textbooks and put them on our reserves so that uh, if they were adopted, a student could actually use the textbook if they wanted to. Um, and the other thing is we wanted to have them available for faculty to look at. Uh, and we have we do take them with us when we do um, in-person, face-to-face meetings and uh, workshops about open textbooks. There's also a textbook program at uh, SUNY, um, State University of New York. So you can go look at all of their textbooks at textbooks.opensuny.org. And then um, Oregon State also has a very robust program in, in the state of Oregon funding the production of open textbooks. They have quite a few upper level um, course open textbooks. So they're starting to branch into those areas that aren't covered by OpenStax. And you can take a look at their collection by going to Open Oregon State Education. And of course, one of the easiest ways to find them, we had already talked about the open textbook library. I still think that is the gold standard in locating open textbooks. And it is most likely that all of the open SUNY and open Oregon textbooks are um, discoverable in the open textbook library. So let's talk a little bit about um, how using op open textbook positively impacts college affordability. So um, it's, it's not new information for most people that average spending on textbooks by students has risen um, over 430% since 1989. And so what they spent in 1989, now they're spending um, over $700 on textbooks. And an average undergraduate now spends the equivalent of 11.9% of the cost of tuition on books and supplies. So it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't seem like much, I think, from semester to semester. And uh, sometimes um, our institutional community might have challenges understanding why students have such a problem purchasing their textbooks for courses. But when we take a look at that cost over time, we can see that it has a big impact. It should be noted that this impact is even greater on community college students. 
Um, and that's a function of lower tuition costs. But just because students have lower tuition costs at community college doesn't mean their textbook costs are any lower. So the impact of high textbook costs is even more palpable in, um, at the community college levels. And I think it's important to know that textbook cost has a, there's a variety of ways that it can impact academic success and time to graduation, both of which are big concerns. Here at Wayne State, um, we have a lot of students who are not traditional. They take more than six years to graduate, but we know that every year beyond that sixth year makes it more unlikely that that student will graduate. So here's some statistics from some recent studies. More than three out of five students have skipped buying or renting an assigned text due to cost. And we know that um, if students don't have their textbook, haven't purchased a te textbook, especially in a course that is math and science oriented or that requires a lot of reading like a humanities or English course um, from the textbook, that not having the access to that textbook is going to significantly impact their ability to pass that class. The next one is even a little bit more disturbing. Three in 10 students decided not to take a class because of the high cost of textbooks. This means students aren't taking classes. They may not be taking as many classes a semester as they should, and that's going to impact their graduation rate, their time to graduation. And that is not good. And courses with open textbooks see significantly lower drop rates than those with commercial textbooks. And this, act, this finding was ac actually uh, came from a meta-analysis done by Clinton and Cohn very recently in uh, 2019. And that was um, an impactful finding. So that's really all about I had to talk about today. I wanted to make sure that you knew what open textbooks are, what the um, Creative Commons licensing was and why it's important and how there are different licenses, where you can find open educational resources, and um, finally, how adopting open educational resources can impact student success. So I'd like to open it up now to any questions or comments. Actually, if anybody um, attending today has, um, you can either use your microphone or you can uh, put something in the chat box and I'll respond to it um, via the microphone. If you have any questions or any of your own ideas that you'd like to share today. uncomfortable silence. <laughs> I'm wondering how many people attending today have um, have a where it's their it's their responsibility to um, to facilitate information about open educational resources on their campus or if you know of the people that have that responsibility on your campus. All right, so it doesn't look like that's the case. It can be a very it can be very challenging to um, to try to get uh, momentum going on campus. I uh, highly recommend trying as much as possible. Oh, that's great. Okay, so CT Brooks. And uh, which campus is that? Um, C.T. Brooks. Oh, okay, fantastic. 
so you have a you have a group we we also have a group of many um representatives uh from we have OT, our office for teaching and learning um our uh, learning management system director and uh librarians who are spearheading the the activities on campus and we have had great success partnering with our student senate um, of course you have to have a student senate with members who are interested but our student senate has been very interested in open educational resources and we have had a lot of success partnering with them and having them move things forward um, in through our university administration they have they have the ability to get the ear of um, people that actually we don't. So I, I highly recommend if you don't uh, have students, um, student representation on your open education um, or OER group, please consider that because they can be amazing allies and we've really benefited from um, their support of our work. Well, that's all I had for today. Um, nobody ever complains about ending early, right? So thank you all very much for um, attending today. I was really happy to see everyone who came. Um, I hope that you found this valuable. Again, uh, you can find this PowerPoint presentation on the uh, guides page and you feel free to download it and use it the, any of the information however you like in the notes section you'll find the um, links to the references for all of the statistics and resources that were listed um, in this presentation today so thank you all very much and have a great day <laughs>